What comes to your mind when you hear the word idol? Now, most likely, one of two images pop into your head, some kind of a star or some kind of a statue. You're likely thinking either American Idol or a Canaanite Idol. Now, be it modern society or ancient cultures, when you get right down to it, we've always treated our idols the same. Be they star or stone, historically speaking, we look to idols for guidance and fulfillment. We look to our idols to enlighten us and to save us. Now, I dare say, as you're sitting there, it's very possible that you're thinking something like this. Why are we talking about idols? I mean, is this our topic for the next few weeks? Because if it is, I'm checking out now because this is completely irrelevant to my life. I mean, I live in the 21st century, Darren. I don't struggle with idols or idolatry. Okay, fair enough. But before you go, let me just say this. The strange thing about idols is they're a lot like bad breath. We're often the last person to realize that we have a problem. Around 2,600 years ago, a man named Ezekiel found himself standing in a room full of influential men. These men were the elders, the leaders of the nation of Israel at that time. And they came to Ezekiel because he was recognized as God's prophet. And they were looking to him for guidance. Suddenly, the Spirit of God spoke to the prophet Ezekiel and told him this. Son of man, these men have set up idols in their hearts and put wicked stumbling blocks before their faces. Should I let them inquire of me at all? Now, I am certain that when Ezekiel told those men what God had shown him, their first response would have been, Who? Me? Idols? What are you talking about? I don't have idols in my home. I mean, come to my house, Ezekiel. See for yourself. I swear to you, my home is absolutely full free of idols. Come, look in every corner, look in every closet. I guarantee you, Ezekiel, you will not find one single idol anywhere in my home. But that's not where God said their idols were hiding. God didn't say these men have set up idols in their homes. God said these men have set up idols in their hearts. The unique thing about idols, the thing that makes them so difficult to recognize, is they not only can hide in the darkest part of our homes, they can also hide in the deepest part of our hearts. You see, idols are like termites. You have them before you know you have them. Now, over the next few weeks, we're going to go deep. Over the next few weeks, we're going to take an honest inventory. Over the next few weeks, we're going to open our minds at least to the possibility that we could have some idols hidden away in the very depths of our lives. Now, doing this, going on such a journey, demands that we first ask and answer a foundational question. So, what exactly is an idol? How are we defining that term? Now, there are many things that could be said, but I've chosen two very clear, very key descriptors. First of all, an idol is a good thing that has been turned into an ultimate thing. When looking for idols in our lives, we get fooled when we think we're looking for something bad or ugly or gruesome or demonic. An idol is often a good thing that's been turned into an ultimate thing. We can sometimes take good things like a successful career, like love, material possessions, even family, and we can turn them into ultimate things. We place these good things at the center of our lives because we think these things will provide us with significance, security, and safety. We think if we can attain and sustain those good things, we'll then be fulfilled. Which leads us to another attribute of an idol. An idol is anything that you turn to to give you what only God can give. When you're turning to a good thing to give you what only God can give you, you have turned that thing into an idol. Anything can become an idol in our lives. Any good thing can be turned into an ultimate thing. We can mistakenly look to anything to give us what only God can give us. Anything can become an idol, but we're going to spend the next few weeks focusing upon three things. Three good things that over the centuries, have constantly been turned into ultimate things. Three good things that humanity has, time and time again, looked to as sources of fulfillment, purpose, meaning, and value in life. 
outcomes that only God can ultimately provide. The three things we're about to study are money, sex, and power. Over the next few weeks, we're going to dig into each of these good things to learn how God designed them, how we tend to abuse them, and how we can reclaim them and experience them as the good things that they truly are. Now, we're beginning today by talking just a little bit about money. Okay, stop right there. What are you feeling right now? Now, be honest. Did you just feel a wave of something rise up from within you? Did you suddenly feel a tiny bit nervous or agitated or maybe defensive when I said the word money? Now, be honest now. I'm not asking you to raise your hand. I'm just asking you to raise your awareness. When I told you I was about to talk about money, did that subconsciously trigger something deep within you? Oh, it wasn't a conscious reaction. You didn't even have time to consciously process it. Yours was an immediate response. It was an impulse. You're not even sure why you responded the way you responded. But if you're honest with yourself, you have to admit you felt it. When you heard me say the word money, something deep within you got triggered. It was like I stepped on a tripwire and set off a security sensor in your life. Your alarm got activated, your lights went on, and your defenses went up. Is it possible that this could be a sign that money has become an ultimate thing in your life? Is it possible that this could be a sign that you look to money to give you what only God can give you? Let's dig a bit deeper. So what is money? Well, in the early days of human history, each person had to produce everything they needed for survival, and life was hard. Then they discovered the advantage of bartering, where different people specialized in producing different areas. And when they all traded with one another, it got easier. Like, you grow corn, I raise sheep, Mr. Lee produces molasses, Mrs. Sanchez produces cheese, and we all trade and barter with one another. Bartering worked reasonably well, except bartering could be inconvenient. I could only trade when I had excess flocks or when the sap was running or when my produce was fresh. And I could only trade with someone who wanted what I was producing when I was able to produce it. So this led to the eventual creation of what we refer to as a money economy. The community agreed upon a resource, a commodity that was convenient meaning it could be easily stored and carried, and it was something that everyone valued. Over time, various precious metals became the preferred commodity, with gold becoming the most popular. So then, what's money? Money is an agreed-upon resource that represents value in a community. The value of my labor can be quantified by a certain amount of money. The value of an item can be quantified by a certain amount of money. Money is an agreed-upon resource that represents value in a community. Now, is money good or is money evil? I mean, how does God view money? God is not against money. In fact, God owns all the money. The Bible says, The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. Who has a claim against me that I must pay, God said. Everything under heaven belongs to me. Scripture says, to the Lord your God belong the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth and everything in it. So how does God view money? God's not against money. In fact, God owns every penny on the entire planet. Every penny you have belongs to God. He owns it, every penny of it. All of your money is actually God's money. God's just letting you use it. And when it comes to money, God's the owner. You're the manager. So understand this. Money is not evil. It's not wrong to earn money. It's not wrong to have money. It's not even wrong to have a lot of money. If it's wrong to have a lot of money, God's in big trouble because God owns all the money in the universe, remember? So, now this undoubtedly surprises a lot of people when they hear it. Well, doesn't the Bible say that money is the root of all evil? Actually, the Bible doesn't say that. Here's what the, one of the authors of the Bible actually wrote. He wrote, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Read that again. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. 
So notice this. It's not that money itself is evil. There's all different kinds of evil. But the Bible says loving money is a root, one of many roots of all different kinds of evil. It's loving money. God warns against loving money because loving money leads to greed. And greed is, get this, idolatry. Greed's idolatry. Look at what the Apostle Paul described in one of his letters, the letter to the church in ancient city of Colossae. He said, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, your sinful nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. How is greed idolatry? Well, let's go back to our definition of idolatry. An idol is a good thing that has been turned into an ultimate thing. An idol is anything that you turn to to give you what only God can give. How is greed idolatry? When you slip into greed, money becomes the reason you do everything you do. When you slip into greed, money becomes your motivation. When you slip into greed, money becomes the deciding factor in your life. Now, show me the reason for your living. Show me your reason for doing. Show me your motivation in life. Show me the deciding factor in your life, and I'll show you your God. That is why greed is idolatry. One day, Jesus stood before a crowd of thousands of people, teaching them. He was warning them about people and things that could destroy them. When Jesus took a breath, someone in the crowd shouted out at him, Hey, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now, there's something you rarely see. Family members fighting over money. Apparently, what had happened was uh, uh, the father had died, leaving money to this older brother, and the older brother was responsible for dividing it up, and this younger brother was feeling that the older brother wasn't being fair or wasn't even dividing up the money, hoarding it for himself. Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Jesus basically says, why are you bringing this to me? There are courts and officials who deal with these kind of disputes. Now, while Jesus stays out of the legal aspect of the matter, he dives into the heart of the matter. Then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Now, I want us to take note of a couple things here. Jesus says, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Now, compare this to another sin that Jesus warns against, adultery. Jesus never has to say, be careful you aren't committing adultery. I mean, when you're having a sexual relationship with someone who is not your spouse, you know it. Halfway through, you don't stop and say, hold on, I'm not certain, but I think this might be adultery. When it comes to adultery, you don't have to think, you know. Not so with greed. A person can be trapped in the clutches of greed and not know it, or at least be in denial about it. Remember what we learned earlier about idolatry? Idols are like termites. You have them before you know you have them. So Jesus says, watch out. Be careful when it comes to greed. I want us to know something else in this verse. Notice the word consist. Life does not consist in abundance of possessions. Now, that word consist in the original language means to be composed of, to be made from, to be defined by. So Jesus said, be careful, be on your guard against greed. Remember, your life is not defined by, composed of your money or how much, how many possessions you have. The danger of money is hidden in the lie of greed. Okay, so let's pull everything together. What is money? Money is an expression of value. It quantifies value to assist in commerce and trading. How does God view money? God's not against money. In fact, God owns all the money on the planet. Every penny that we have is actually borrowed from him. God's the owner. We're merely managers. God doesn't warn against having money. What God warns against is loving money. Because loving money leads to greed, and greed is idolatry. And what's idolatry? Idolatry is turning a good thing into an ultimate thing. Idolatry is looking to something other than God to give you what only God can give. 
And this brings us to today's big idea where we sum up the teaching one simple phrase. Don't let God's provision become God's replacement. Don't let God's provision become God's replacement. If we are not careful, the good that God provides for us can become a God to us. God's provision can become God's replacement. And it begins with greed. The lie of greed is incredibly subtle, and it is incredibly powerful. You start off with good intentions, but over time, drip by drip, drop by drop, before you even realize it, you are looking to your possessions for your significance. You're looking to your money for your security. Before you even realize it, you have turned a good thing into the ultimate thing. Before you realize it, God's provision has become God's replacement. This is the lie that hides at the heart of every temptation to steal or to covet. The lie that money is my source of independence. The lie that money is my source of security. The lie that money is the key to gaining access to everything I want or everything that I need in life. It's a lie that can become embedded deep within us. And there is nothing more deadly than a deeply embedded lie. Many years ago, decades ago, I was pastoring in a church back in Ontario, and there was a young woman in my congregation. Um, Tanaya was her name. Her and her husband had befriended uh, Jan and I, and Tanaya was beautiful. She was literally a model, but Tanaya didn't think she was beautiful. Tanaya thought she was ugly. Tanaya hated her body to the point that Tanaya so destroyed her body that she found herself in a, a psychiatric hospital um, because she re refused to eat. And even her husband would not be able to visit her. I was the only person who was allowed to visit her for some strange reason. Long story short, Tanaya so starved herself to the point that one day she would, she would binge and purge and binge and purge till one day her stomach literally exploded and Tanaya died. Now, here's the thing. No matter how hard people tried to break through the lie in Tanaya's life, Tanaya could not let go of the lie, the lie that she was obese when she wasn't. No matter how much evidence was placed before her eyes, no matter how much truth was offered to her mind, she held tightly to the lie until one day that lie literally destroyed her. The lie that promised to protect her and help her actually punished her and killed her. So what about you? Are you believing a lie, a lie that is embedded deep within you? Are you believing the lie that money is the ultimate, that money is your source of value, worth, safety, and security? Has money become or is money becoming an idol in your life? Have you turned a good thing into the ultimate thing in your life? If so, I've got good news. There is a way out of the trap and back into the truth. The first step is to recognize the lie. There's an old saying, you can't fix what you won't acknowledge. So the first step out of the trap of greed is to see it in your life, to acknowledge that it's present and to acknowledge that it's a lie. The second step is to renounce the lie. Once you've recognized it, you need to renounce it. That means you consciously reject it and you intentionally turn your back on it. How can a person exit the trap of greed? First step is to reject the lie. The second step is to renounce the lie. And the third and final step is to replace the lie with the truth. Now, you can take the first two steps in just a moment as we close this time together. Next week, when we're together, we're going to discover how to take this third step. Next week, we're going to discover God's answer to resisting and replacing the lie of greed. The systematic way that God himself designed to enable us to resist the false view of money and replace it with a healthy and productive view of money. A way that will enable you to prosper without guilt, as well as live in both financial and spiritual freedom. We're going to learn that next week as we continue in this series. Let's pray together right now. God, we acknowledge that there are times in our lives when we look to other things than you for our source of security, our source of peace, our source of life, our source of hope. We repent of this. We acknowledge it. We don't want to live that way any longer. 
So we ask you, Spirit of God, to reveal to us areas in our lives when perhaps there are idols starting to surface. Show us the truth so that we can live according to the truth. We want you to be on the throne of our lives. Maybe you're watching me today and you've not yet placed Christ at the center of your life. Maybe there's something else in your life that you're looking to, to give you what only God himself can give. If you would like at this time in your life to accept Christ as the Lord, the Savior, the God, the leader of your life, if you want to accept his gift of forgiveness and eternal life, just pray this prayer with me right now. Agree with me as I pray on your behalf. God, I acknowledge my rebellion. I acknowledge my sin. I acknowledge that I have placed other things at the heart, at the center of my existence. And I remove them right now. I don't want to live that way any longer. And I invite you, God, to live at the heart, at the center, at the core of my being. I accept your gift of forgiveness and eternal life. And I ask you now to fill me with your spirit and to lead me and guide me and give me wisdom from this day forward. In Jesus' name, by his authority, I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with me and you're wondering, what, what next step should I take? The best advice I could give you is to text the number on the screen right now. Now, don't worry, we're not tricking you. You're not gonna be placed on a mailing list. We're not gonna phone you back. We are simply gonna text you back and offer our advice to you and offer our help to you in any way that we can, just to help you take the next step in your journey. Well, God bless you. Thank you for being with us today. I hope you join with us next week as we continue in our Money, Sex, and Power series here at Broadway Church.